Hi guys, Ricky Pope here, and this week on the Christian Nerd Unite podcast, I'm joined by Scott Adams, creator of the first text-based adventure game for personal computers, Adventureland, plus scripture and nerdy news, and we'll get to all of that right after this. Hey nerds, this is David with Tatooine Sons, a pop culture podcast. We believe that pop culture is the mythology of our generation. There is a story, it is written on our souls, and that all of these myths speak to that story. And that is why every Tuesday I talk about Star Wars and Marvel and DC and Lord of the Rings and whatever nerdy things we can think of with my two sons, Sam and Nate. It is a 30 to 45 minute celebration of all the weirdness that we love so much. Basically, mom said we couldn't talk about it at the kitchen table anymore, so we decided to start a podcast. We hope you'll check it out. It's on every podcast app out there. Tatooine Sons, that's Tatooine S-O-N-S. Thanks so much for joining me this week. You are the reason I do this podcast. If you missed our live stream on May 4th, we announced the start of the Christian Nerd HQ Podcast Network. Christian Nerd Unite Podcast is joined by Tatooine Sons, who you just heard from, Fangirling Over Jesus, and the Reverend and the Reprobate Podcast. Make sure you go to ChristianNerdHQ.com to follow all the podcasts and see the content we're making together. Now let's read some scripture. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Many passages of scripture talk about serving together or not going alone, and this passage is one of my favorites, asking us to think how we can encourage one another in Christ. That's part of the reason we launched Christian Nerd HQ. We as Christian podcasters are encouraging each other and finding ways we can serve the larger community of nerdy Christians out there, just like you. How are you encouraging other believers to serve and and love people, whether that's in person or online? I pray that the Lord will show you how you can get involved. Now for some nerdy news. The Writers Guild of America has officially gone on strike for the first time in 15 years. Late night talk shows and Saturday Night Live have halted production. Marvel's up-and-coming Blade film that was expected to start shooting later this month uh, has stopped its pre-production work. The second half of the final season of Stranger Things has also been delayed. The previous strike went on for 14 weeks, and if the time frame is similar, it could affect the fall seasons of TV shows. One of the biggest issues of contention is streaming services and how much that the writers are getting paid for that. Since most streaming services like Netflix and Amazon keep their viewer numbers mostly secret, it's difficult for writers to know if they are getting properly compensated for their work over time. Carrie Fisher finally received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame on Thursday, May the 4th. Carrie Fisher did not live to see this moment, but her daughter, Billy Lord, accepted the star on her behalf. She is quoted as saying, my mom is a double whammy, a Pez dispenser, and has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Mama, you've made it. Mark Hamill was also in attendance and said, she played such a crucial role in my personal and professional life, and both would have been far emptier without her. Everything would have been drabber and less interesting if she hadn't been the friend that she was. 
Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 opened this weekend, and no surprise, as of this recording, it's number one at $114 million domestically and $282 million worldwide, giving it a better opening weekend than Marvel's previous outing, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, and finally knocking the Super Mario Brothers movie out of first place. It's pretty much meeting the expectations of those who predict box office numbers. Critics and audiences both appear to like the film with 81% of critics and an audience score of 95% on Rotten Tomatoes. And responses in our own Christian Urge Unite Facebook group agree. Many are saying it's the best Marvel outing since Endgame. I would love to hear what you thought about it as well. Scott Adams helped launch the home computer game industry. When I first reached out to him, he asked, are you sure you have the right Scott Adams? Thinking I might be looking for the one who draws Dilbert, but I assured him I was talking to the right Scott Adams. Scott is a man of faith and started learning computer programming in the early 70s and has done some amazing things. We talked so long, I decided to go ahead and split this one up into two episodes, so make sure you check back next week for part two. Now, let's get right into our interview. If you would like to start there, we can start there right now. Sounds good. Hi, Rick. I appreciate being asked to speak here. Before we get started, as I mentioned earlier, I'd like to start with a prayer. Dear Jesus, Lord and Savior, I thank you so much for the blessing of modern technology to be able to reach out and and say hi to a lot of friends that I've made over the years and new friends I hope to make in the future. If not now, then in eternity. I pray this finds everyone in good health and and well-being, but we know we live in a sinful world. So I just pray for your spirit to be with me during this interview and to be able to do things that are uplifting and in your will and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Scott Adams, it is great to have you on the Christian Urge Unite podcast. And uh, for those who are out there listening, um, there's two different Scott Adams. And uh, uh, actually, when you and I connected, you even asked me, are you sure I'm the right Scott Adams? I have been getting a lot of mail addressed to (laughs) another Scott Adams. Because of it, I've made some very interesting friends, and uh, God's will has really shown through. So (laughs) That's not a bad thing. (laughs) It's providential. It's not an accident. Uh, Absolutely. Well, this is the, the Scott Adams who kind of started the home computer video game industry. So tell us a little bit about who Scott Adams is. Oh, oh, that's such a broad opening question. (laughs) Uh, And you said is and not was, which is interesting. Um, (laughs) Hi, all. I am, um, as you can tell from my opening prayer, I'm a follower of Christ. I don't belong to any specific denomination. If you try to nail me down, the closest thing I would say is I'm probably Messianic Jew in that uh, I'm Jewish heritage. Uh, my grandfather was an Orthodox rabbi. Oh, I was wow. I was raised in a, um, a culturally Jewish household, except when mm. grandparents were there, and then we might have been a little more <laughs> religious. Um <laughs> I was bar mitzvahed, um, so it gives you some basis. I did not come to Christianity way later because I was a a Jewish atheist, which is not Mm. as uncommon as you might think, Mm. and really didn't have any strong beliefs one way or the other uh, until it happened that I finally reached out and actually said, God, are you really there? Show me. And he tapped me on the – wow, I can feel the spirit right now – he tapped me on the shoulder and says, yes, I'm really there. And things in my life changed a lot. Uh, and that was in my 30s. When I was doing Adventure International, which most of you are probably more familiar with, I was in my 20s. So I was not a follower of Christ at the time. I was an atheist. Okay. And everything I did, I was doing from a purely selfish viewpoint. I was trying to make money and trying to be mm-hmm. successful from for myself and my family. 
But looking back on it and listening to the stories from the people that people have told me, I can see God was really using me during that period. I was Balaam. I was Balaam riding on a donkey, not knowing what was going on. Uh, so I just praise God's name. I always loved computers and I love computer games. I can remember being in elementary school in the 60s and uh, home computers didn't exist at that time. Mm -hmm. Microcomputers didn't exist. The only thing available were mainframes. Yeah. And our school got to do a field trip and I'm pretty sure it was University of Miami because I lived in North Miami Beach. And we got to do a field trip to see the computer center, and it stuck wow. in my mind. Because back then, we didn't actually go in the computer center. This was such a special sanctum that there was a glass wall area where you could see the computer center through. <laughs> and inside, everybody's walking around. There was the spinning lights and the blinking tapes. Scratch that. Reverse it. Uh, you get the idea. Anyway, uh, it was amazing. And I said, I want to go in there. And the teacher says, oh, no, I'm sorry. You can't go in there. That's that's only for the computer scientists. And it was like as a kid, I was, oh, yeah, I'm going in there one day. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, shall I continue? I can I can give you quite, yeah. quite a bit yeah, of interesting give us background. Yeah, give us a little background. I, I'm 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 super interested in in how you got into computers in general, and and in, then how you got into the gaming industry. Uh, okay, kind of well, starting I didn't one of the in, one of the the leading companies in the industry. I didn't back get then. into the industry. I literally had to start the industry. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> it's true. Um, so uh, let let me let me hit some highlights here. So, all right, elementary school, fascinated with computer. I remember in sixth grade, uh, we had a math course, and it was binary. We learned oh, to wow. do in binary. I loved it. I thought it was incredible, especially when I was told, this is a language computer uses. Okay, well, then I want to learn it. And so I learned binary. It didn't do me much good. I remember <laughs> seeing things in uh, advertisements then. It might have been Boy's Life or something else. Buy your own real computer. Basically, it was a, a glorified mechanical calculator, but that mm. sort of thing really attracted me. <coughs> so, um, move forward a bit further, and I'm now in high school, and I'm in 11th grade. Uh, still no real computers in my life at the time. Everything is non-computerized. This is, <coughs> again, in the 60s, um, so around... 67, 68. Um, uh, touch tone phones were, were just about the newest thing at the time. Color television had appeared by then. Uh, so, but things were still pretty simple. Um, man was on his way to the moon, but hadn't arrived yet. Uh, so you get the idea. Mm. So, uh, my mother decided that I was going to become a doctor. And mm. I was already enrolled for, I had got accepted and enrolled because of honors classes and, and uh, uh, grades I had to go in for early admission to University of Miami to go into pre-med. So I was all set. And I told my mother no. After, and I don't know why I did this, but I did. I simply told her, no, I, I'm not ready. I want to go to my senior year in high school. I'm not going to University of Miami next year. And it was a battle royale. It really was. Uh, my mom was um, uh, pretty determined she knew it was best. And I was pretty determined it wasn't right at this time. And I actually won. So I didn't go. And what happened was uh, in my senior year at North Miami Senior High, state of Florida did an experiment and they picked one high school to put a computer terminal in. Oh, and wow. It, yeah. I walked into the Math Resource Center one day and there's a, a machine sitting off in the corner. Um, and I, what, what is that? What, what is it? And they said, well, it's a computer terminal for University of Miami. I said, what do I do with it? We have no idea, but it's open <laughs> to students and you can do anything you want. 
Um, I found out it was a uh, hooked to the mainframe, and it was running something called APL 360. So it was a 360 mainframe. APL is a programmer's language, mm-hmm. it, but it's also a mathematician's language. You can take the determinant of a matrix with a single operator to give you an idea. It's literally Greek characters. So the first language I learned was literally Greek to me. Because (laughs) I I had to learn Greek characters. The way it worked was a Selectric typewriter. They took the normal English type set ball off the top, put an APL ball on it, and the keyboard had the APL uh, characters overlaid for shifts of keys. And I got the manual from the University of Miami. I spent my own money. It was 10 bucks at the time. I can remember that. And trust me, in 1967, Mm. 10 bucks was a lot of money. I took it home, devoured it, read it, and went, wow, I can write programs on this. And so I I did. I started playing with it. I did uh, the traditional Hello World, which wasn't traditional back then. There was no Mm -hmm. such thing as a traditional Hello World. Programming was kind of new in the world. Mm. But I wrote some simple math programs. So uh, give me two numbers, I'll add them up. Give me a matrix, I'll give you the determinant. And I'm going, wow, this is fun. Now I'm going to flash back. To something that happened in 1960, this was 1963, the New York's World's Fair in Flushing, oh, New York. Yeah. I was 12 at the time. I remember this well because I was studying for my bar mitzvah on the way up, and I could not do my haftorah because I'm totally tone deaf, and you're supposed to <laughs> sing your haftorah. Oh, joy or rapture. Anyway, <laughs> got up to the New York's World's Fair, amazing exhibits there. Um, I saw a lot of things that later became part of Disney because Disney displayed it. I remember the Ford mm. Pavilion. There's a Netflix special out, by the way, uh, out uh, that I just recently got the disc of that went over the New York's World's Fair, and it hit a lot of the highlights. were simply amazing. It brought mm. back a lot of memories. But anyway, our family went up there in a motorhome, and we spent, I think it probably was a week there, Oh, wow. Uh, I've got lots of good memories of it, but my biggest memory was the IBM Pavilion. Mm. You went to the IBM Pavilion. You were lifted up into it with uh, the seats went up in the stadium. They gave some sort of presentation, which I cannot for the life of me remember it at all. And then they exited you out to the basement. And in the basement Mm. were actual exhibits. And one of the exhibits that I saw that I immediately gravitated to was play the computer tic-tac-toe. Oh, wow. And there was a long line there of people wanting to play tic-tac-toe with a computer. This was this was novel and, and, yeah. and fascinating. So I went forward, and finally it's my turn, and I got up there, and I looked up, and there's a tic-tac-toe board with lights, and next to it were two big signs that weren't lit. And one of them says, computer wins, and the other one says, tie. And I and the guy said, okay, it's your turn. You can play. I said, well, wait a minute. There's something wrong with those signs. Where's the one that says, I win? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, sorry, you cannot beat the computer in tic-tac-toe. I said, oh, yeah, watch me. Well, I proceeded <laughs> to have a tie day game. And it, I learned something then. The game of tic-tac-toe is deterministic. If Mm. you know what you're doing, you never lose. Yeah. You you can win, but you can never lose if you know what you're doing. All right. So now we're back in high school, and I'm thinking, okay, I want to really write a real program now. What am I going to write? I decided to write a tic-tac-toe program. Hmm. And I did. And I've actually used this example for mentoring kids a lot um, because it works out very well, whether it's Visual Basic or mm. C Sharp or whatever language. If they're interested in game writing, try writing a tic-tac-toe program because you can do it in stages. Your first stage is simply being able to represent the board some way and take mm. players' moves so two players can play. And then determine if one's one, determine if a move is legal, et cetera, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm building this game, and I got permission. 
I remember his name, Mr. Nordmeyer, was the head of the Math Resource Center. Amazing how things like that stick with you. I got permission where I was the only student allowed to come in early when the janitors got there and they would <laughs> let me in. I had a key to unlock the phone so I could dial up. This had a modem. You dialed up a oh, regular, wow. regular phone. You had to unlock it, dial on a modem, reach the mainframe, and stick it in, in the modem cradle to hook this electric up. So I got the key to that. So I got permission to stay in there. And then I also got permission to stay as late as I wanted, as long as I locked up the school behind me. <laughs> That's so awesome. I was literally there six o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night and uh, before and after school, just writing my, t my uh, tic-tac-toe program. I just had a blast doing it. And I finally got it done and it ran and it was able to, to never lose a tic-tac-toe, and I was so excited. Wow. <clears throat> so I contacted the University of Miami and said, I've got this great program that I wrote. I'd like to put it in your d public domain storage area so others can play my game. And they said, well, let's take a look at it. And they got back to me, and they said, no, we don't want it. We've already got a tic-tac-toe program, and it's far better than yours. And I was <laughs> shell-shocked. Oh, but that didn't stop me. I got the program. I downloaded it. And APL um, is is basically an unlocked language back then in that you mm. can you were running an interpretive language so you could see the source all the time, sort of like basic. Oh, OK. Yeah. So I took the source where mine was reams and reams of of pages that I literally hand coded at home with pencil and paper <laughs> and then went in and typed it in. Where wow. mine was like eight, 10, 12 pages of code, this is all done in one page. And I looked at it and I learned all sorts of amazing program tricks. Mm -hmm. And I realized if I want to learn how to do this stuff, I got to learn. I got, I got to figure out things for myself, but there's so much others can teach me. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was uh, my first computer game. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I gave that code or one of my early APL 360 code to uh, the Strong Museum in Rochester, New York. They've got, I, I donated my collection to them. And, oh, wow. Uh, I remember having a pack of APL program that I think was that original game, but it may have been some other program that I wrote while I was in high school, too. Mm -hmm. um, unlike later, where I had to, all programs were on punch cards, this was actually digital because you entered it in and you had the paper trail as the selectric mm. uh, uh, scrolled it out. <clears throat> so I went uh, off to college um, and because I had spent that year learning about the computer, I told my mm. mom, not only wasn't I going to early <laughs> admissions at University of Miami, I wasn't even going to go to University of Miami to be a doctor because I wanted to be a computer, computer scientist. Nice. And she says, really, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 the school I enrolled in was called FIT. They build themselves as the MIT of the South. Um, okay. They were kind of unique. They, I was in um, my, living in Miami. They were in Melbourne, Florida, which is halfway up the state of Florida on the Space Coast. They were okay. literally the only fully accredited school in the United States at that time, college, that still had its founding president because oh, wow. he built it around the space program. He started it because mm. of the space program, and he wanted to uh, have a homebrew, a Florida base for en uh, an engineering college. Mm. Um, so I went up there, had an amazing time. Um, I went up there as... Uh, a work study student, which means that I was I was supposed to be able to get a job on campus to help mm. defer tuition, um, and I was hoping I would get a job at the computer center. That would be cool. Mm. But yeah, I went in, talked to them at work study, and asked, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to work in the computer center, and they said, yeah, yeah, you and a thousand other kids, you're kidding. <laughs> uh, we may be able to get you a job in the library. Okay, well, here's. Wow, I feel the spirit on this. Here is a working of the Holy Spirit that was so totally amazing. 
my roommate that I was bunking with, his name was Craig, had mm. already written ahead and gotten permission to get a job in the computer center. He oh, wow. was going to be working there. <clears throat> I heard that and I said, well, when you go in, do you mind if I tag along? He said, well, I don't think so. I mean, this was for me. I said, I'm not going to hurt anything. I'll just walk in with you. You know, what can it hurt? <laughs> A little chutzpah there. <laughs> I did. I walked in. Uh, the director of the computer center was there, Mr. Brown. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know. I, something hit it off because I told him what my dreams were, what I had been mm -hmm. doing. I told him about what I had learned. And he gave me a job. I remember my oh, first wow. job at the computer center <clears throat> was sticking mailing labels on the alumni newsletter. <laughs> but I was in the computer center. Now, to fast forward real quick uh, through my college years, by the time I left the col uh, college, after three years, it wasn't when I left, after three years, I was a programmer for the college, and I was in charge hmm. of all their financial programs, payroll, oh, wow. accounts receivable, accounts payable. I was doing all that because of my work that I was doing for the college. I was getting free tuition remission. So I was getting free college education. So wow. I, this, this was amazing. This, this opened up mm. so much to me because I had access to the mainframe. The schooling mm. there had access to a DDP 24 cast off from Honeywell that came from the Cape that was upstairs. There were literally long lines. You had to sign up to use the machine. Oh, and you get a, a fixed slot of time on it. Whereas I could saunter in. I use the mainframe whenever I want, 24-7, literally. <laughs> I was a, one of a handful of programmers there, that, uh, and I had full access. Well, what happened was I remember I had one class where I had to do an assembly language program for this DDP-24 upstairs. Well, instead of doing just the assembly language program and waiting in line and trying to use that machine, I wrote an entire simulator of that computer down on the mainframe. <laughs> then I wrote an assembler for it. Then I wrote my project in that assembler and turned it in. <laughs> Literally. Oh the my. next year, there was an as uh, assembler course uh, for uh, do writing an assembler. I said, I've already done this. Let and they found... The instructors, I showed him what I did. He had me guest lecture the course. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> this this is what my outlook on computers was. It, it, just because you can't do it, that wasn't going to slow me down. Um, wow. So I graduated. Um, I went to work for RCA. And this, this, was, this has okay. a game, some gaming interest because uh, at the time um, when I went to work for RCA, I literally did this. After three years of high, uh, three years of college, I was kind of burnt out, working full summers, working full time, and mm. so I took a hiatus and went to work on the Air Force Eastern Test Range for RCA down on Ascension Island. Spent a year and a half there. Back then, if you were a year and a half out of country, for if you were out for seventeen out of eighteen months, you'd get tuition. You'd get sorry, uh, you had to pay no U.S. taxes. Uh, and that was like, okay, I can save up a nice nest egg here. They're paying my room mm -hmm. and board. Um, I can collect some money. And so that's what I did. I came back, then finished my degree, uh, and then went back to work for RCA uh, because of what I had done down on Ascension Island. They were very happy mm. to take me back. This time I got stationed at in Antigua in the Caribbean. Oh, wow. And I was uh, staying on air, on the Air Force Base down there, <coughs> which was an amazing time for me. I love movies, by the way, besides computers. And I instigated <laughs> myself into the movie. Uh, I they would show movies on base. I made friends with the the projectionists, uh, and they then allowed me to become a projectionist. So I was an amateur projectionist, and I would play movies at odd hours of the night, and the base would congregate there because I just like <laughs> showing the movies. Um, so while I was working there on the base, this was a radar station. Um, mm. And what they were doing was classified. So I'm not going to get into that. What I was doing was classified. So I'm not going to talk about that. But what I did with it outside of that classification is kind of interesting. They mm. were 
RCA was trying to get another contract from from uh, Space Defense Command, and okay. this computer is very similar to one on Ascension, but it was smaller and didn't have as much memory, and they couldn't quite automate everything that they had down there. But they mm. were trying to get the contract so they could do similar things. So they were going to have a test for a week. During that week, that they were manually doing a communications layer where things that had to be sent, they would do by hand with people typing in. They're getting further and further apart. And then they asked, is there something I can do to help? And I jumped in and said, yes, I think I can. And I literally saved their bacon by getting the computer to do <laughs> what it wasn't supposed to do. Oh, wow. Uh, for that size computer, they won the contract. They're very happy. Nice accommodation level. What that meant was they were very pleased to let me do whatever I wanted on that computer whenever I wanted. And they were only running uh, uh, one to two shifts, not three shifts a, a day like the other station was. Mm. And so what did I do with all that free time on the computer? <laughs> Can you guess? I played games or wrote games. <laughs> I got a Star Trek program from another uh, programmer that ran. Oh, in, wow. that was written in Fortran and would run on that mainframe and it would run on the teletype. And it would print out one play screen at a time. You'd make your move and print out a new play screen. So it was turn-based. But there was a lot of teletype action between. Teletypes were rather slow, if you've mm. ever seen one in action. Here I am playing the game, and I'm looking over at the radar screen, and I'm looking over at the teletype, and I'm looking over at the radar screen, and I thought, I wonder. I converted <laughs> the game to use the radar screen <laughs> and the operator's import. So I literally turned this multi-million dollar radar station into a Star Trek game. <laughs> Not many people got to play it because it was it was a classified installation, but a lot of us had fun. <laughs> That's amazing. Playing Star Trek on it. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> so, so what would that be? That would be like what 1975, 1974 ish? This, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see, 69, 74. Yep, uh, mid 70s would be wow. about right. So you, you're you're getting the idea of what I like to do with computers. <laughs> well, it definitely makes sense why you would start a video game company. Oh, there's uh, only more. a few years later. <laughs> oh, there's there's a few more steps between now and that company too. <laughs> okay, which are also some interesting firsts. Um, uh, I went. I had mentioned that I had gone back to school. Mm. and finish my degree. Uh, during this time, I was living in Melbourne, Florida, and I have two younger mm. brothers who graduated okay. from high school, and they came up to live with me because I had bought a house uh, when I was going to college. It was oh, my wow. first house, and I did that at my dad's insistence. He says, paying rent is ridiculous. Mm. You might as well buy a house and build some equity. The, and the family helped loan me the money so I could get in uh, um into the house and one of the caveats was that uh, when my brothers came up to go to school they could stay there with me mm. well sure not a problem so i got a, th a three-bedroom house and so literally there were the three of us at one point living in this house and either going to fit or i may have been working for rca yeah i was also working for rca too and i don't remember when this these events occurred <clears throat> but what happened was my brother, who's also um, fairly clever, went and got a um, bit slice chips uh, for, it's called an M16. And I think it came in four bit slices at a time and you can build mm. up a computer. And he literally built a 16-bit computer from, from these bit slice CPUs. Oh, wow. And then my other brother built a TV typewriter for it so you could enter text in. Um, mm. So you could do some peeks and pokes and put stuff in. I sat down. I remember seeing uh, Space Wars in the arcade. And I wrote a another Star Trek type game where it was strictly keyboard and you're only playing with characters. But on the screen, your little E would move around, E for Enterprise. And then there was a K for <laughs> Klingon. And you could shoot each other. So it was, it was a, a <laughs> space fighting game. As far as I know, it's the world's first 16-bit computer game. 
that was ever oh, wow. written. Um, there is a sidebar on my personal website at msadams.com uh, where my brother took some uh, video of this and he saved it. And I remember at one point he even asked me for the source code because I this was all handwritten and compiled. I had to invent some techniques to make this work. I literally did hand linking by writing, learning to write uh, a page of software, but leaving at the top jump tables so that each function would be reached by a jump table. And then as things moved around, uh, there would still be some uh, easy way to recompile, re assemble it because I had no assembler. I'm doing everything with peaks and pokes. I wrote the whole thing in pencil. You can see all the erasures and everything. And then I hand assembled it into the ones and zeros and and had the, and I don't remember if it was hex or octal on that machine. I'm pretty sure it was hex that I had to peek and poke in to make it work. But I did. Wow. I, I got the game working. And so this was another thing where I was <laughs> gaming and learning things. So I had two very mm. smart brothers with me. Uh, one of them who did the hardware, another one who did the TV typewriter, and I was doing the software. Wow. This isn't the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> There's more, as they say, and I still haven't started Adventure International. <laughs> <clears throat> the next step was, um, okay, so now I have done appliance computers. Um, it was a blast being able to do that. Um, actually, this may have occurred before the imp, but I'm not sure. I actually don't remember the time frame. A computer came out called the Sphere, uh, just like a round globe, Sphere. Hmm. Uh, the It came out the same time frame as the Altair Mits. And okay. I don't know if it preceded it or, or happened at the same time. It was a tiny little ad in the back of Radio Electronics that said for, I think it was $750, you can have your own computer that had a screen, had a keyboard, and had a cassette mm -hmm. port. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and had a ROM and had, I think, 4K of memory. And it was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Wow. So I literally put in an order for it. Once again, my family helped. They loaned me, everybody loaned me a little bit of money so I could afford this exorbitant uh, cost. And I paid everybody back eventually. I found out later that I was the very first order that they got. I was oh, the wow. first <laughs> order. And it didn't even exist yet. They were, they had this <laughs> idea and they were putting the ad out and they were collecting the money from people so they could finance actually making this. So it was sort of crowd. It was kickstarting without even knowing you're doing kickstarting. <laughs> um, and I remember I was down on Ascension. I, no, I was on Antigua at this time. Okay. So that puts it in, in perspective. Eventually I got, I got the computer. It was a kit. Once again, this wasn't a computer mm. you got. You've still got a kit. Like still had to build it. Yeah, um, but somebody else had designed it, and it had a case. Um, I built it. I soldered it all, did it all, got it all working, and plugged it in, and nothing happened. <laughs> Fortunately for me, I was on a radar station that had to work reliably, and there was a lot of mm. engineers on site, double E's, that helped me debug the hardware. And we found the bad chips and the bad solder connections, and we finally got it going. So mm. that was so absolutely incredible. Wow. Um, move forward a little bit in time. Now I'm back home with this machine. Bring it home. <clears throat> and I decide I want to use the machine for what I always wanted to use machines for, write a game. <laughs> so what I wanted to do was a tank war game. At the time, mm. I had seen okay. one in the arcade for two players. Uh, tank war controls would allow you to use your hands like mm -hmm. this so i i invented a controller that would allow you to <laughs> go back and forth like this basically it was a box with two wires inside and two metal posts coming out so when you moved one forward it would make a contact there move mm -hmm. it this way it would make a contact same with the other one so i had two bits that i could pull into my pio um, okay. and see what was what was happening. And then I threw a fire button in on one of the top, one of the buttons inside with the wires running through, and that would be 
be able to fire. And I made two sets of these controllers, and I wrote the game for it. Well, there's one small problem, though. The uh, Sphere computer, as it was originally invented, only was text. It had no graphics card. Mm. So I had to invent the graphics card. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally did. It did have a backplane. It did have a bus. And so I invented a graphics card for it. I invented the memory upgrade. Well, I didn't invent the memory upgrade. I was able to do a memory upgrade with 2102s. And I think it was a 16K that I ended up with. Um, each one was a 1K bit slice. So it was 16 by 16, somewhere in that neighborhood. There's a ton of chips on that board. And I got the game in and I got it working and I got the tank core game going. And then when things blew up, I had a buzzer that I hooked up to. So when something blew up, it goes and the tank <laughs> would jiggle back and forth. And I built a, it was all 2D top down. You're looking at it and the two players would be side by side, just uh, pixel graphics, very primitive. Uh, I don't remember what I had for the resolution of the screen, but it, oh, it couldn't have been that great, but it was enough. <clears throat> And just about this time after I got it finished, uh, I had the machine for about a year. Sphere published in their newsletter a contest. What do you use your Sphere computer for? And so I entered my game. I entered the video card I invented for it. I entered the controller <laughs> specs for it. And uh, I got a nice letter back saying, I won their first annual. What do you use your Sphere computer for? Unfortunately... Oh, wow. All the stuff that I sent to them, I kept no copies. I, I took a Super oh. 8 tape that I sent to them showing the gameplay. That's all lost. It, it disappeared oh. when that com company went under. The founder uh, did die. Um, I, by the time I started looking for him, it was, it was long gone. My machine got picked up by a collector um, sometime in the late 70s, I remember just before I moved to Orlando, somebody mm. who collected computers bought it. And I just hope it ended up uh, in somebody's hands. It was kind of unique because because I had all these expansion cards that I did on it, I took the expansion tray out of the case and mounted it to the top instead of inside so I could get to all my boards and be able to mm. Uh, fiddle with things. So if anybody ever finds a sphere with the expansion frame mounted to the top of the cabinet, it might have been mine. <laughs> so this this now takes me to a more um, it now takes me to the point where you ask how did I get into selling games? Mm. So th this was all for fun up to this time. Um, I always enjoyed the entrepreneurial spirit when I was a kid and slot cars were a big deal. Mm. I, re I remember getting slot cars of my own, getting permission from my parents to turn our garage into a slot car haven, and I would charge a nickel <laughs> for the local neighborhood <laughs> kids to, to play slot cars. <clears throat> anyway, um, about this time, the TRS-80 came out. It wasn't called mm. the Model 1 because they only had one. It was just the TRS-80 computer. Uh, they did have two levels, a Level 1 and a Level 2. I was primarily interested in Level 2 because Level 1, though, was good and cheaper. It was 4K, and it had a um, tiny basic in it. Level mm -hmm. 2 excited me because it had a 16K, and it had a better basic from a small company I had been following that I thought their basic was really phenomenal. Um mm. I had heard about their basic in reading in articles, but hadn't been able to use it yet. It was some tiny little company out. Uh, I think they were in Washington at the time. They were called Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> it had Microsoft basic and that's what sold me. Um, basic is uh, basic was my first adventure into computer programming. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was kind of where I, I got into this, the world. It's a but, good place. Uh, I did to not start. advance very far. <laughs> but it, it's a good way to give you a taste. Absolutely. Uh, so I got the machine, finally got the machine, and uh, I was so excited. And, of course, after playing with it a little bit and entering their few demos that they had, I decided I wanted to write, can you guess, a game. <laughs> and what did I write? I wrote a piece of junk called Dog Race. 
basically you had two dots that ran across the screen and you could bet on which one would win. <laughs> but it, it was a game. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't much of a game. Um, I took it in a local radio shack uh, and said, can I sell my game here? They, yeah, sure. We'll put some cassettes up and we'll notice. It might have sold two <laughs> or three copies. It was, it was pretty sad. <clears throat> okay. So I'm playing more with this, and then I'm getting into basic, and I said, no, oh, this basic has a feature that I've never seen in Fortran, and I've never seen in COBOL, never seen in Assembler, and I knew all those because I've been doing a lot of that mm -hmm. work. I'd worked on mainframes like uh, DEC. I'd been working on Xerox Sigma series. I'd worked on IBM. But basic had something unique that was that DARPA had in, not, I don't think it was DARPA, Dartmouth. Dartmouth Basic. That's okay. where it originally came out of. And it's something unique called strings, which meant you can manipulate English text. Mm. I thought, that's kind of cool. I want to learn this feature, but I need to do something with it to learn it. And whenever I learn a computer feature or something, my first go-to is, can I write a game with it? Mm. <clears throat> I was working at Stromberg Carlson at the time on the on a their first digital central office for tele, fel, telephones. Uh, no more clanking relays. And, boy, if you ever saw uh, how telephones worked in the 60s, it was a mechanical, <laughs> awesome mechanical miracle that mm -hmm. ran. Relays and switches that were uh, literally eight feet high, clicking away, doing things. So they were digitizing it, and I was one of the mm -hmm. programmers in there. At Stromberg Carlson, uh, we did not have computers. We had one mainframe, and we all had terminals to it. And mm. then there was the programmers and everybody using it, the engineers, and then there was the IT staff. They were kept separate. The IT was different from the programmers. Well, I found out that the IT staff had gotten a copy of a game that they had put on the computer and that they were playing it. And so I got permission to get a login so I could play it. And I came in um, every morning before work, sound familiar? And I would stay every <laughs> night till late. My wife is going, where are you? What's going on? And I played this game for a week. And it just totally, totally fascinated me. And I got through and I finished it. It was a one-time deal. It's a one-shot th through and done mm -hmm. type game. But it really inspired me. Um, the name of the game was colossal caves adventure ah yes and it was it was uh just just awesome it was amazing getting to hear some of scott's stories next week we'll hear even more about his journey and about some of the work he's done in faith-based games so make sure you listen next week well that's all i have for you today don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, click, click all those links down here, there in the show notes so you can keep up with us at, every time we release content. And you can find all of our social links, links to our YouTube channel and to our online store at ChristianNerdsUnite.com. And don't forget to check out Christian Nerd HQ to see some of the other podcasts in our network. If you enjoyed the show and want to help even more, consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. We've changed all of our Patreon levels, and every level has great benefits and makes a huge difference in the ministry we're able to do. Supporters will also get to hear exclusive stories of believers who are serving around the world through our ministry partners. To check it out or to partner with us, go to patreon.com slash christiannerdsunite or christiannerdsunite.com and click support in the menu. Before you go, I do want to leave you with this blessing from Romans 16. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll see you next week. Blessings. Hey.